So, how's it going, guys? I'm Mike Heisey. I'm here to tell you about the progress I've made in the last four weeks or so on the Adaptive Game Math Library. Now, to begin with, for those of you guys who maybe weren't here last time, just a quick recap, what is it? Well, two things, basically. Platform independent and very fast. The way it does the, these two both, whereas many other libraries do either one or the other or neither, is that it uses some techniques that it borrows from, uh, from modern GIT compilers. So basically, when the, program, when the program first loads, it looks at the architecture it's running on, and it loads into the data section of binary, the, excuse me, not the, data section, the uh, text section of binary, the, uh, the corresponding fast function that's been written specifically for that architecture to be fast on it. And this avoids doing things like having a, uh, having a branch on every time you enter a function to see which, which fast path I want to go through. So it, uh, it started out over the summer, it's continued out through the semester. We made some good progress on it. So our goals for the semester were three things basically. We wanted to do some code cleanup, we wanted to add ARM support, and we wanted to write more tests. The code cleanup thing was because it was written originally um, in a style that you may be familiar with, which is throw everything in one header. Which is <laughs> you can imagine the problems with that. Um, convenient from a developer's perspective, especially when one of us may have been using a tool that we can only really get to, to build the whole project that way, yes. Convenient for the users, no, not at all. Especially when you're building something performance intensive, they don't like to have their binary bloated because they have to load every single function in your library to use any of them. People aren't fans of that. With respect to ARM support, um, the adaptive there referred to loading the fast path on whatever we were on. We didn't have a really good fast path written for ARM at all. We, had, we were fast on x86, on x86, specifically on Intel x86, and then even more specifically on that for really for reasonably recent stuff. Like i3 or later, I think, is when SSE3 support kicked in. So we wanted to get at least one other architecture that we had a fast pass on instead of just falling back to whatever the C++ compiled down to. And with the tests, well, the way we made a lot of things fast was by vectorizing. And the way you vectorize things, if you don't want to drop down into assembly, which I will get into later that you don't, is that you use compiler intrinsics. And when you're using a bunch of compiler intrinsics, control flow has a way of getting a little bit more confusing than it was. Because instead of a, a time sign, you have something like mmmulps, which is not really as obvious to people. It's like looking at Lisp, except with the parentheses for, replaced with horribleness. So anyways, <laughs> so the first thing that I, that I started on this semester was the code cleanup. Now, we immediately had some, uh, some pushback here. And when I say we, I mean uh, in that C++ templates, um, really do not like being split out into things. It's very hard to do the, the good C thing where you split, a, where you have a, a, a header file that has the interface and then a separate impl implementation file. The reason for that is because almost no C++ compilers actually implement the part of the C++03 standard known as extern templates. So you're forced in some ways to put implementations in header files, which is dirty. Um, fortunately, we were able to do some other cleanup that, that was a little bit easier to get get going, which was specifically to just split up header files. Some of them had, some of them were getting to the point where they had like 30 functions defined in them, and that's just absurd. So we did get some progress by splitting header files up into separate header files for subcomponents and things like that. This also made the make file a little more complicated. Um, make files, if you guys aren't familiar, um, are basically like staring into the mouth of Ketua. Uh They make, is anybody here familiar with the poetry of Virgil? The any of, any of the Latin, uh, maybe, maybe Homer in the Greek. All right, make files look, make obfuscated Perl, like Perl that's used in Perl golf, look like that sort of classical poetry. <laughs> by comparison. They just, they get, things get bad really fast. Um, if you're familiar with any of the, if you want to hear about any of the other downsides of make files, talk to Frank Katarski, he and I are working on a project in a, in a class to obviate the need for it. But, uh, but anyway, so the code cleanup has progressed a bit, although we're still kind of blocked on the C++ template implementations. With respect to tests, this is almost self-explanatory, but if you write all the code first and leave almost all the tests for later, you are not a happy camper later. Now, we didn't do this. We didn't do this quite this bad. We actually, we were developing some tests in parallel, but near the end of the summer, when our main implementation was going, we were pure in you know, code writing and optimizing mode. And that meant that a lot of tests got left for later. And unfortunately, that kind of 
the, the, we, we kind of have to pay the piper now. Because just writing pure test code is not fun. Most people like to develop things and see, you know, oh, there's this new feature. Or, oh, hey, we have a 2x speedup. Or, you know, a, even a 1.1x, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's nice. When you're just writing stuff where there's all downside and no good side, your motivation tends to set. And it's very difficult to, to continually remind yourself of what the goal is. So what I would recommend to all of you today is to balance your veggies and your ice cream. Don't have your dessert before dinner. Write your tests while you're writing the main code, please. All right, now on to happier times. ARM support is actually moving a pace pretty well. Um, it's a little bit different than we suspect than we expected. Um, Peter, I believe last time you asked me what iPhones that uh, ARM Neon, which is SIMD, which are the, uh, the SIMD instructions work on, it actually didn't come in in the 3G, it came in the 3GS, the iPhone 3. See, um, it actually, it was part of ARM V7, which any ARM with Cortex in the name of it supports Neon, basically. Um, unfortunately, my phone, this little LG Optimus rinky dink thing, also doesn't support Neon. <laughs> so that made testing a little more difficult. What's good, though, is that the generation right before it, which my phone has and which the, th the iPhone 3 and the 3G both have, does support some SIMD instructions. They're just called ARM SIMD instructions. If you Google for ARM SIMD instruction set, 98% of your hits, including all of them, the first five pages of Google, will be instruction set for Neon, instead of the ones you're actually trying to develop for. But it can be found and you can develop with them. It's a little bit of a restricted set. You're, you have fewer floating point operations than you want, and you mostly have various widths of integers. But you have them and you can test them, and that's nice. The other nice thing is that GCC has intrinsics for them, which means I didn't have to drop down into assembly to do things. Now, can anyone guess why I wouldn't want to drop down into assembly for a C++ project? <laughs> it's, it's, it's good that people have fond memories of comp or volcanoes. <laughs> so, yeah, when you do this, you complicate your life in a lot of ways. Um, especially because we're trying to be cross-platform. We're trying to work on things where GCC is our compiler, where Microsoft is our compiler, and that gets really diff difficult when you start having to link assembly files to C++ files. Is anybody here familiar with name mangling? All right, we got at least a few. All right. Um, basically, when you want to load a file that doesn't have function names mangled, you have to declare x turn c and things like that, which isn't too difficult. But you want you wind up running into more serious problems when you're trying to run a make file or a build system for this, and you're trying to get the linker to do things correctly and not fight you and not shoot you in the foot. See, as an aside here, if anybody here is ever doing embedded development, avoid like to play anything with a Kyle compiler. If anybody, if any of you took Live Tech a long time ago, which probably not, we had used the Kyle compiler, and the linker would die fatally on any file name that had spaces in it. So, <laughs> modern technology development continues apace. But, uh, but anyways, so GCC has has support for ARM um, for ARM Neon intrinsics and ARM SSE intrinsics generally, which is nice. It meant I didn't have to drop down into assembly. And I actually found out while I was doing this development that ARM Neon and other ARM SIMD in a lot of ways is actually nicer than x86 SIMD stuff, which are the MMX or the SSC things. As a, as a little bit of a way to demonstrate that, the uh, one particular instruction that we, wind up, that we wound up using a lot on AGML that was vectorized was MMADPS. Does anybody have a guess what that does? Add pack single. Hmm? Add pack single. Yeah, basically. So. Just, just clear what it does, right? All right, so what does the MM mean? Um, Intel decided to use these bizarre MM prefixes for everything. Yeah, multimedia, because the original x86 vectorized instruction set was MMX, multimedia extensions. So instead of calling them vectorized something, they called everything multimedia something, because they assumed this was going to be used mostly for graphics codecs and stuff like that. Because this happened in like 1996 or so, before NVIDIA came and kind of, you know, destroyed the idea of software renders. Which, maybe someday will come back, but, you know. Anyway, but anyways, so the, uh, the ARM versions of these things, they all start with V for vector. The next thing is always whatever they are, add, mult, things like that. And the next thing is F32 or U32. It's the exact data type it operates on. It's very simple, it's very obvious when you look at things, what they do. It's not quite as obvious as if you had pluses and multiplication signs on your operands, but it is a lot nicer. The uh, GCC support is actually, for them, is pretty nice too. MSVC, the support isn't quite there. It exists in terms of it has the types defined, but they're a little bit buggy, and also it doesn't have little bits of syntactic sugar 
Like if you want to assign four things to a SIMD register, you can't just put them in curly braces like you can on GCC. You have to do it. You have to do a vector load essentially. But it's really not too bad. And the other thing that was nice is that the performance came in almost exactly where we expected it to be. Naively, we thought that if we're doing vector operations on four things at once, we should get a four times speed up, right? Well, in reality, there's overhead. On any architecture, pretty much, the vector register, register file is a separate register file for your main set of registers. So you have a little bit of overhead in terms of shuffling things <coughs> out of your regular registers or out of it, or you know, getting them from there to the vector registers, or putting an immediate value there or something like that. But the overhead isn't that bad. In practice, we were able to get almost the exact same speed up that we got when we were doing the x86 implementation of these, which was nice. That felt good. There's a caveat there. We didn't get it right away because we ran into one of the same problems we did. Anybody want to guess, take a wild guess, what problems you might, ha you might come into with respect to factorizing code? All right. Think of, think of if you're doing, a, let's say a, my vectorization unit is, is four things, right? I can fit four values into a, into a vectorized register. And I have a list of 10 things to do. I do the first four, then I do the second four, then what do I do with the last two? You have lots of fun figuring that out. But uh, <laughs> no, basically you, you do have issues with that where you've, got a, where you've got little bits of stuff left at the end or at the beginning if it's not aligned, where you have to deal with it in a serial manner anyways. That's actually surprisingly not where the overhead came from though. Does anybody here like their ego being boosted sometimes? Because one of the easiest ways to do that is to write vectorized code, because it's one of the only ways in existence where a human, a competent human, not even a really skilled human, can routinely beat the code that an optimized compiler generates and by a wide margin. And even more surprising is the fact that what you're actually beating is the register allocator. Now, does anybody know, anybody here know about the register keyword in C and C++? All right. Um, Matt, I'll pick on you. What does what the register keyword do? Um, it's supposed to... <laughs> it's... Uh, more than more Matt. <laughs> it's, uh, Whichever Matt has the, uh, the semaphore. <laughs> okay. it's, um, it's supposed to say that that variable is stored in a register. Yes, and what does it actually do? Absolutely nothing. You guys know why? Because register allocators have been a lot smarter than humans for at least 15 years. There is literally no compiler in existence these days that has been touched in the last like decade where the register keyword is anything does anything at all. The compiler ignores you because it knows you're not as smart as it is. <laughs> inline is going this way, but it's not quite. If you use inline, that actually does increase the heuristic that a function will be inline. But register does absolutely nothing. You, you, I mean, like spitting on the screen has more of an effect on generated code than using the register keyword. That for the storage class. <laughs> However, the compiler's hubris is a little bit limited here because what happens is that when you write vectorized code, it drives the register allocator nuts because it's done on a separate uh, register, register file. So it doesn't know how many things it's actually using from what we can tell. So what does that mean that it does? Well, in the middle of a nice tight vectorized code, it throws in a store and then it, sto and it throws in a load. Now, let's say you're doing nice vectorized instructions that have maybe uh, a throughput of or we won't even say through, but let's say the delay on one instruction is, is six cycles, right? So you're going, you're going pretty quick, and then you throw in a store and a load to memory. What do you guys think the cycle penalty for that is, for hitting main memory? It's like, massive. Yeah, yeah it's, it's on the order of like 150 cycles that you've just thrown away. You, it's like throwing money into a fire. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> when I say great, I mean terrible. Thank you, Ben Bernanke. Anyway. But, uh, so yeah, so it just does these stupid things for reasons that are very difficult to fathom. There are two ways you can get around this now. You can either, you know, sort of throw in the towel and write your own assembly, which you really don't want to do for reasons that I've said before and many others. Or you can try to trick the compiler into doing what you want. <laughs> there are two ways that you can do this. You can either use the restrict keyword, which the pro is that you're not saying anything semantically about, this, about the, uh, the values you're using, except that they won't be aliased elsewhere, which is nice. Or you can use const. Usually when you use const, the register allocator will, uh, will sort of assume that you never really want this thing put into memory. That's not always true. If you, do, if you have a, a value that you can declare static const, it'll always do that for you. But it won't always. But the bad thing about const is that if you need to modify a value, you've made yourself a big fat liar. So, so the best way to do this is to try to qualify things as restrict 
and generally poke around with it, which is a great engineering principle, by the way, until it does what you want. <laughs> Usually it will, though, and you can get that nice speed up that you, that you were looking for. It would be really, really nice if there were a standard way to, uh, to give the compiler these sort of hints, but unfortunately, so far, there isn't. I'm actually close to filing a bug on GCC about this because it's not fun. But, uh, but anyways, progress is moving pretty, pretty quickly. Um, I'd really like to give a thanks to Morthy, of course, Sean O'Sullivan, and our sponsor, and everybody else at Arcos who's given me help, especially Matt and Jarrell, who were the, the driving forces behind the project this summer. So, does anybody have questions about? Uh, I remember you mentioning binary bloat a little bit. Uh, what's the benefit of doing the on runtime, uh, choosing your code path for your architecture versus just compiling a library for every architecture and like, distributing? Um, mostly because it's a it's a pain in the rear to distribute things that way. That's the big that's the big downside to that. That's the reason that we didn't wind up going that way. Um, and also that we have a little bit more freedom this way with respect to having a greater amount of sort of uh, what do I say? We can we can we have a much smaller granularity in terms of features we can support. Like we we can check beyond just an architecture. We can also check whether it supports SSE two or SSE two and SSE three. If we didn't do that, we'd wind up having to get the same level of granularity. We'd wind up having to compile, you know, for every, you know, some exponential number of different sets of the thing and distributing them separately, which would get bad very quickly. Okay. You know, especially as we're trying to grow the number of architectures and feature sets that we support, that would that would, you know, well, combinatorial explosion is probably a, a phrase you're familiar with. It's essentially what would wind up biting us in the rear. Males, come on! I know you guys love Comboard when you took it. <laughs> Um, you were talking about the loads being um, 150 millisecond delay, and is it in ARM? Is a load completely block, just like heck, block the CPU? It's not quite that, but essentially, you you it's almost unavoidable to stall your pipeline. It's usually um, ARM recent ARM architectures are out of are out of order execution. They tend to a little bit of instruction reordering to help you that way, but they're not omniscient. They, they aren't perfect doing it. They've had out-of-order execution units for, for a shorter amount of time than x86 stuff has, so they're not quite as good yet. And also, there's sometimes when you have a, a dependency, and you, you know, the ARM pipeline on recent stuff is like, it's about eight deep or so. So there will be times when you'll have a dependency chain that's basically as long as that, so once one thing stalls, everything's got to wait for it, and there's no way around it. Anybody else? Mike, when you said about the engineering thing about um, uh, uh, putting in constants, how did you measure that and whether the, is that repeatable, did you repeat the experiment multiple times with multiple yes, compilers um, and multiple architecture? Yeah, um, the two compilers we used were GCC and MSVC. We found the same, the same issue repeatedly on GCC and MSVC for x86 SIMD instructions. So far, I've only got the uh, the ARM Neon stuff working on GCC, so I haven't been able to repeat it there. But since I have a pretty good, you know, intuition that this is the register allocator blowing up in the same way in two places, it I'm pretty confident that that it would carry there as well. How is that MSVC ARM support? It's not that bad. It supports the intrinsics. It doesn't have quite as much sugar as GCC does. Um, I haven't really tried compiling the uh, the ARM SIMD instructions on MSVC so far. I've got a little if that flag that just tells it to ignore things so far because I want to have stuff sort of nailed down and working in one place first. But it's not as bad as I expected. One of the reasons that's I've heard that one of the reasons that it's improved recently is because Windows 8 is also targeted to run on ARM, so they've kind of had to you know play catch up to this area that they were ignoring for a few years. All right, well, thank you, folks. Great. Great. Great.